Tonight, a state of emergency. We're now beyond our city's capacity, and that is why we've called in the armed forces. Ottawa makes plans ahead of the rains, plus the case for a new approach to flooding. There's a tremendous concern that this will actually cause more anti-Semitism. After an allegedly staged assault, the hateful response, just what Winnipeg's Jewish community feared. This is the face of the healthcare crisis in Nova Scotia, and I dare you to tell me otherwise. And a powerful Facebook message to a premier. Why it struck a nerve with Canadians everywhere. This is The National. Thirty rounds, thirty rounds of radiation to my pelvis, which has left me barren and infertile. At thirty-three, I am in menopause because when my tumor was a polyp, I did not have access to a family doctor, and the ERs wouldn't help. It is painful, personal, and hitting home for many Canadians tonight. Inez Rutterham's video describing her struggle to get a cancer diagnosis while a tumor grew inside her has been viewed around two million times. That's since Tuesday. Her video is a challenge to her premier to look into the face of what she calls a healthcare crisis in Nova Scotia. Here's Tom Murphy. Look into my eyes and tell me that there is no health care crisis in my province of Nova Scotia. I dare you. Ines Rutterham is surviving cancer and is also a victim, she argues, of a failing health care system. I am a 33-year-old mother. I went undiagnosed with anal cancer for two years because I did not have access to a family doctor. Rutterham had a doctor who she says left town. She had to rely on emergency room visits to access health care. She says she went to three ERs before, in her words, someone would listen to her. Are letting people die. The backdrop here is this. Nova Scotia has been trying to cope with a doctor shortage for years. Finding new ones and keeping them is difficult. And many of them want lighter workloads than their predecessors. Right now, 51,000 Nova Scotians can't find a family physician, so you get cases like Rutterham's. Having a family doctor is your best bet at being able to catch those critical diagnoses. There are challenges in the healthcare system. The Premier won't use the word crisis, but promises to look into this case. Would you meet with her? Well, the department, I've asked the department to do that, and then I'll wait to hear back from the department. For Inez Rutterham, it's been a draining ordeal. And now she says she's infertile from 30 rounds of radiation. It's okay though, right? Because they caught it. They caught it when it was stage three. And I fought. I fought for my life. But there's no health care crisis. After all of that, another fight. Rutterham says she's been waiting since January for mental health services to help cope with her cancer diagnosis. She finally got an appointment for July. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. Now, Tom mentioned the 51,000 Nova Scotians who can't find a family doctor. Those are just the ones on a formal family doctor wait list. It's about 5% of the population. But in 2017, more than twice that number, about 13% of Nova Scotians, said they didn't have a regular health care provider. And compared to the national average, that's doing pretty well. Consider Quebec. More than 20% of people there say they don't have a family doctor. But wherever people without one live, they are less likely to be screened for serious underlying diseases. Okay, now to Winnipeg, where we are seeing the nasty consequences of what police call a hoax. Now, you'll recall a Jewish family's restaurant was vandalized in a vicious way, except police say it was all staged. And now, blowback that goes beyond disappointment. Here's Cameron McIntosh. White supremacists are reveling in it. Exactly what many feared. And here it is, okay? 
On white pride sites, the story is moving swiftly, this one in Canada, drawing snide responses including a cartoon of a Jewish man desecrating a Jewish grave. A variation of this theme uh, that the Jewish community is lying about its persecution. None of it surprising to anti-fascist activist Helmut Harry Lowen. If this is what this turns out to be, the only agenda that's furthered is that of neo-Nazis and anti-Semites. Oksana Berendt, her husband Alexander and son Maxim are charged with public mischief. After reporting she was assaulted in an attack that left her cafe trashed and vandalized with anti-Semitic graffiti. They say it wasn't them. Can you imagine how I feel when my place is destroyed like that? What did I do to you? I built this place, okay? Police say otherwise. The incident here in Winnipeg this past weekend was staged. The evidence, police say, will come out in court. Inside the cafe, you can still see signs of their investigation. Backlash against the family has been swift. A Jewish gay and lesbian advocacy group moved out of the building they shared. We were shocked. Uh, we were beside ourselves. We were completely floored. The concern is held widely. There's a tremendous concern that this will actually cause more anti-Semitism. Court records show the family is facing lawsuits over debts. They deny staging this for financial gain. And I don't want people to judge us, okay, wrongly, because we didn't do it. We had no reason to do it, okay? Now, none of these allegations have been proven in court. What's also unclear right now is whether the family will try to reopen amid all this disappointment and anger. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. So, Rosie, just one of those stories where you, you can't help but wonder how on earth did it come to this? Uh, but you're on top of another story brewing in Ottawa, but rippling out far beyond. Yeah, that's for sure. Canada's privacy commissioners, two of them, have a message to all 24 million Facebook users inside this country. The social media giant is acting irresponsibly and your data just isn't safe. That warning comes after an investigation concluded that Facebook committed serious contraventions of Canadian privacy laws in last year's Cambridge Analytica scandal when millions of users' data were leaked without their consent and used for political gain. The privacy watchdogs say Facebook hasn't learned its lesson and there's still a high risk your personal information can be used and shared without you knowing. They're so troubled by it all, they say they want to sue Facebook to better protect you. So, Facebook has broken the law and broken the trust of Canadians. Evan Dyer looks at how likely it is that officials can change that. Facebook has spent more than a decade apologizing for its actions and pledging its commitment to people's privacy. However, when it comes to concrete actions that will fix these transgressions, they demonstrate disregard. The BC Privacy Commissioner and his federal counterpart say they've given up on Facebook making changes on its own. Canada's laws just don't seem to worry the social media giant, they say, and it has no real incentive to obey them. The current law uh, says that all I can uh, actually do is recommend to Facebook uh, that they change uh, their ways, and they have disagreed to do that. Facebook says it's been negotiating in good faith and was ready to make changes. We've proactively taken important steps towards tackling a number of issues raised in the report, which includes offering to enter into a compliance agreement. But Terrian says Facebook has a poor history when it comes to respecting such agreements. This week, the company set aside up to $4 billion to cover fines it expects to be levied by the U.S. Federal Trade Commission for violating a previous promise to safeguard its users' privacy. A loss in a Canadian court won't cost anything close to that. Historically, penalties imposed by the federal court have been quite minimal, uh, nowhere near the amounts that we've been talking about uh, in the U.S. or the EU. It's in the tens of thousands of dollars. The Privacy Commissioners say for things to really change, Canada's laws need teeth that are currently missing. The Trudeau government says it agrees. So I think where we are right now as a government is that we understand that the time of self-regulation is, is coming to an end. Changes are coming, says Gould, although no details on exactly what they'll be. In any event, they're unlikely to become law in time for the next federal election. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa.
So as we said, today's report came out of an investigation into the Cambridge Analytica scandal and the Canadian connections to that British company. You might remember that it was, in fact, a Canadian who blew the whistle in the first place. Well, we spoke recently to Chris Wiley, and he told us why he thinks government regulations for Facebook are overdue. When you look at how Facebook responded to the um, mass murders in New Zealand, right, and they say this every single time, we build these things and they're global and it's really complicated and things happen, right? And we're really sorry that they do, but it's really complicated. And for me, when I hear that, I, I hear, you know, a company like Boeing say, yeah, well, aerospace engineering is really complicated and sometimes their planes fall out of the sky, right? We would not tolerate that. So, you know, for me, Facebook's defense is the best argument to say why we should be regulating them because it is complicated. So we need to ensure that they, they perform due diligence on their products before they release them to the public. Our full interview with Chris Wiley will be featured soon on The National. I know you did that one, Ian. Looking forward to seeing it. Let's turn, though, now to a big story in the nation's capital, where I am, but it's not political. That's right, Rosie. The city of Ottawa has declared a state of emergency. The city has reached its capacity in terms of what we can do on our own to help our residents who are preparing against this flooding. The latest forecasts are calling for another 35 millimeters of rain by Saturday, and officials worry the water will rise 11 centimeters, that's more than four inches, above the 2017 flood levels. What we anticipated was the peak at so many centimeters uh, a day or two ago. Uh, we now have to add sandbags on top of that. The city is bringing in 400 members of the Canadian forces to shore up vulnerable homes with sandbags. Quebec officials have ordered an immediate evacuation of about 15 kilometers along the Rouge River. They're worried about the possible failure of a hydro dam. At least 250 people have been moved. I don't know why on Google Maps it didn't come up and say you can't go through Highway 10. More than 80 New Brunswick roads are closed due to high water, including a stretch of the Trans-Canada Highway. Many New Brunswickers learned their lesson last year, and physically, they're better prepared for flooding this season, but mentally, that is a different story. Kayla Hounsel spoke with one family forced from their home now two years in a row. For people whose homes are surrounded by water, these soldiers are a lifeline. They have a list of homes that were evacuated during last year's spring flood. As we go up and just try and check, is anybody home, is the power on? As one woman is brought to safety, Kevin Craig and Cecile Saint-Ange are standing at the water's edge. Sick, sore and tired. The soldiers agree to help check on their home. My situation this year is pretty much the same as it was last year, only probably going to be worse by the sounds of things. We met the couple last year. Back then they were in good spirits, trying to make the best of the situation as they fled their home. I'm going down to the river. I'm going to wash my soul again. Not this year. It seems to me like they're trying to normalize it, that this is the way it's going to be all the time. And You seem pretty frustrated. I'm pretty you know, depressed and frustrated with it all, yeah. You know. What are your options? Well, I either find somebody to buy it or get the government to buy me out. That's it. Last year, around 70 people accepted buyouts. In those cases, it was uh, the destruction of their homes and properties was so extensive that it was a, a, much, uh, a much better option to take a buyout and relocate. Didn't expect this again. This when we arrive, Craig and St. Ange show us that just like last year, their basement is already full of water. Devastating. That's all I know. It makes you want to cry. And don't think I didn't, because I did, and I ain't afraid to say so. Uh, last year was bad enough. Uh, we tried to do our due diligence and get things out of the basement. We didn't even redo it from last year. They say if they can't get a government buyout, they'll try to sell. I'm done. I'm completely done. Speak me. That's if they can find a buyer. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Grand Bay Westfield, New Brunswick. As extreme weather events become more common, governments and homeowners are rethinking their approaches to flood prevention. As Allison Northcott explains, failing to adapt now could be very costly down the road. Well, why don't we start building natural dikes, integrating them into the landscape. For Jim Base, this newly constructed dike is a sign of a lesson learned. It just 
a, a green space that integrates well into the neighborhood and allows us, if we have a minor rise in the riverfront, at least to have this area protected. The mayor of Pierrefonds on Montreal's West Island is tackling flooding for the second time since 2017, but says his community is better prepared thanks to new mitigation features and a better emergency plan. About 40 kilometers away in Rigo, Ronald Pichet is watching the water surround his home. After the last floods, he raised his house and built a reinforced waterproof foundation to protect it from high waters. The work is ongoing, but it's not finished. This expert studies rivers and floods and says while measures like those can help at a local level, with more extreme weather events due to climate change expected, bigger picture solutions are needed too. In 2017, many people were quite surprised to see that we had either very old maps or even in some areas no flood maps at all, which makes you know, it impossible for citizens to realize that they are in a risk zone. Quebec is updating those maps, but with two major floods so close together, the risk for some residents has become all too clear. The Quebec government is offering some flooded out homeowners up to $200,000 in compensation to leave flood zones for good. Biran says too many people have been allowed to build too close to the water. Preventing development in certain zones, I think now that's quite clear, uh, that these zones may absorb more water if they've le they are left undeveloped. It isn't the only solution, however, it's part of the solution. For now, the mayor of Pierrefonds hopes his dike works, but he also realizes more action will be needed in the years ahead. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Tonight, Sri Lanka is in the grip of an urgent manhunt, four days after Easter Sunday bombings killed hundreds at Christian churches. The government warns that more attacks could come. The tension is palpable in the capital city, where the central bank was locked down today. A bomb scare closed the road to the airport, forcing travelers to walk. The defense secretary resigned, though he insisted authorities had followed up on foreign intelligence warnings. More than 70 people have been arrested. As soldiers scoured Colombo for six more suspects, the government actually reduced the official death toll from 359 to between 250 and 260. The miscount due to so many bodies not being intact. The lower death toll is likely of little comfort to the thousands of people facing unbearable loss. Senior correspondent Susan Ormiston is in Sri Lanka to give us a glimpse of their suffering. Every casket bears a story. And amidst all the grief this week, some are particularly poignant. Mourners flock to remember a prominent physician, a wound specialist, no less, who died of his own injuries in the suicide bombing. Sanath Fernando and his wife Wales both died, leaving behind a rich community life and three children. The eldest, Darren Jali, rushed home for medical studies in China two days ago. It's a hard time for me because my parents were everything for me. This week, attending a funeral like this one means a pat-down, a search, vigilance particularly tight around churches attacked last week. The Sri Lankan Air Force is helping to fortify security, especially when it's Sri Lanka's highest-ranking Catholic, the Archbishop, giving the funeral mass. Darren Jali's youngest brother was in the church last Sunday, standing right between his parents at mass when the blast threw them apart. She believes that in dying, one on each side, her parents protected her brother so he could live on. How do you feel about the people who did this? I don't have words to express my feelings towards them. They have no humanity in them. How could you do, do such things for people like this? They're innocent people. Many are resisting letting go, struggling to accept the sudden brutal shock and the idea that this might have been avoided if only warnings of a growing threat months ago had been acted on. Instead, Colombo is filled with checkpoints and searches, nearly 10,000 military deployed, warnings of secondary threats circulate its tents. The scars still so obvious, a bomber staying in the Kingsbury Hotel blew himself up in the restaurant. Forensic investigators haven't finished their work, so the restaurant can't be cleaned out. Even so, 
The general manager is determined to reopen hotel rooms tomorrow. You know, when you, you stay in a place which has been damaged, you um, resuscitate a lot of what has happened. So by opening also, it's opening a new door for us, you know, moving on and, you know, be positive about the future. That's aspirational, but hard, with the tragedy still so fresh and its damage to lives forever. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Nigumbo, Sri Lanka. Sri Lankan authorities have urged Muslims to avoid Friday prayers tomorrow as a sign of solidarity but also self-protection. It's feared that large gatherings of worshippers might be targeted. Christians have also been asked to skip Sunday Mass. And still ahead on The National, our special series on burnout at work continues. We'll ask the question, can other countries teach Canada a thing or two? Okay, let's hope so. And it's at issue night. Why the election in the country's smallest province could have big impact on the federal field. But first, just what the Democrats need, another presidential candidate. But this is no Joe Who. <laughs> I believe history will look back on four years of this president and all he embraces as an aberrant moment in time. So Biden's in, now a field of 20 candidates. The debate rages among Democrats. What's the best way to beat Trump? Paul Hunter on that, next. For weeks, we've watched Democrat after Democrat declare their intention to run for president in 2020. The list is crowded, diverse, in some ways unprecedented. But one face has been notably absent until today. Joe Biden has officially entered the race. The 76-year-old former vice president sure has the pedigree. But as Paul Hunter explains, that may not be an advantage this time. Meet candidate number 20. That's him in the middle, Joe Biden. Maybe you've heard of him. How does it feel to be the front runner? <laughs> well, it's real early. To the surprise of fully no one today jumping into the race to take on Donald Trump for the White House. In so doing, slamming the president on video. But if we give Donald Trump eight years in the White House, he will forever and fundamentally alter the character of this nation, who we are. And I cannot stand by and watch that happen. Biden calls the 2020 election a battle for the soul of America. That's why today I'm announcing my candidacy for president of the United States. Eight years as Barack Obama's vice president helps make Biden the Democratic front runner. For now, the truth is, for the party, it's complicated. What is the best way to beat Trump? A strongly progressive candidate? They've got plenty of those. Or someone more to the middle? And how important is diversity or depth of political experience? Indeed, is less suddenly better? All of which leads to that other question. Is it even okay to now nominate an old white man? Old guard, say Biden critics, with old attitudes. Lately challenged for being too touchy-feely with women. Then again, say Biden backers, there's this. I'd like to order a uh, pepperoni pizza to go. Ease with the most coveted voting block of all these days, working class Americans of all ages, backgrounds, genders. Today, glad handing with the very kind of people Trump won over in 2016, reminding everyone the only goal is the White House. Bottom line, Biden's in. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. And lots more to come on The National. A fantastic moment for a curling team from Nigeria. The first time an African country won a curling game at a world championship. You know how much I love curling. And PEI <laughs> goes blue, but the opposition is green. The At Issue gang is here to talk about what effect that could have on the fall federal election. Andrew, Althea and Eric are here next. I can't walk. I barely survived. I don't know if I will be able to walk again. And I can't move my hands. 
A 21-year-old man severely injured in a hit and run made an emotional appeal today for the driver to come forward. Navindra Sukram Singh was walking home from a St. Patrick's Day party in Brampton, Ontario last month. He collapsed in the street and was hit by a car while trying to stand up. The driver took off. Sukram Singh's injuries are being described as life-altering. The measles outbreak in the United States has led to quarantine orders at two Los Angeles universities. An infected person arrived at the airport, then went to class at UCLA, also visiting the library. They say they have 2,000 visitors in that library a day. Most of them don't sign in or out. So we've had a lot of exposure to uh, folks that we actually can't identify. It is possible some people at another university were also exposed. 300 students and faculty members at the two schools are in quarantine. Officials say they have to stay isolated for a week or provide medical records showing they've been vaccinated. Amazon has posted another record profit for a fourth successive quarter. The retail giant said it made $3.6 billion in the first three months of this year. The company also announced changes to its loyalty club, Prime, offering package delivery in just one day instead of two. At least one person has been killed and several injured after this fiery crash near Denver, Colorado. Police say an out-of-control tractor trailer plowed into traffic that was stopped from a previous crash. As many as 12 vehicles and three semis were involved and witnesses say they heard several explosions. PEI's election was historic, but perhaps not in the way many were expecting. Islanders responded by granting us a record number of seats, by far the most seats ever won by a Green Party in Canada. The Green surge wasn't enough to form government, but the party is now the official opposition, a first in Canada. And with a progressive Conservative victory, PEI is just the latest province in recent months to flip to blue. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I guess all I can say is... Welcome to a new day in Prince Edward Island. Islanders want to change, but its political leaders campaign differently until the very end. We need more hugging in politics. So what does all this mean for the Green Party federally? And what should we make of yet another province voting out its Liberal government? It's Thursday, and Ad Issue is here to answer those questions and more. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto tonight. Althea Raj, also there in Toronto. And CBC's poll analyst, Eric Grenier, is here in Ottawa. All right, let's start with sort of the big picture, uh, Andrew, and that changing political landscape. We talked about it a little bit last week because it was Alberta. Now it's PEI. Where is the advantage for a federal party in that? Is there one or is there, are there risks and dangers in, in those changes too? Well, the, the clearest winner obviously is the Green Party. Uh, yes, they didn't win the election as some polls so they might, uh, but they've made a historic breakthrough to be official opposition, to have eight seats, uh, to have won 30 percent of the vote. Um, what that does, I think, it's no guarantee, but what it potentially does for the federal Green Party is make people look at them in a different way, mm -hmm. that it doesn't, you know, I think the knock or, or, the, or the, the reason why people might not give them a look who might otherwise be sympathetic to them is, well, you can't ever get elected, you're, you're just a protest party. And now they can say to people, no, actually, we can get people elected, we are more of a, of a serious party, of a real party. That's been, they've been knocking on that door now in several of the provinces where they've been starting to elect people where they hadn't previously. They have that one MP in, in the parliament in the form of their leader, Elizabeth May. Uh, so this just gives them that much greater credibility and maybe people will give them a look who might otherwise not have. It does, I, I wonder though how much of that, the, that win had to do, uh, maybe I'll go to you Eric on this, on the fact that their platform was, was quite progressive but not uh, not too far left if you know what I mean like it, it addressed a whole bunch of issues it wasn't just climate change or just the environment it was it was progressive on a lot of fronts and it was very local in the sense that Peter yeah. Bevan Baker who's the PEI Green leader was very popular he was polling way ahead of Dennis King who ended up winning and Wayne McLaughlin who was the outgoing premier got defeated so I think that we have to take into account uh, how uh, popular the leader was in that case because if you're looking at the last poll that was done in Prince Edward Island uh, that had breakouts for federal and provincial politics. The federal Green Party was at 10 percent at the same time that the uh, provincial Green Party was at 34 percent. So mm -hmm. people on the island were differentiating between the two parties 
And I think that for the PI Greens, what played in their favor was, yes, that they had a very popular leader, but that he was offering something different, that in that province that had only ever been governed by Liberals and Tories, that he was another option, a third a way to go. And I think for a lot of voters, that was an appealing option. But certainly we shouldn't uh, separate the, the local factors that mm -hmm. contributed to that green surge. But we're seeing the greens up pretty much uh, across the country. So I don't think that's a coincidence. Does that put sort of a, a, a new or added pressure on Elizabeth May to do more than she has done in past elections, Althea? Well, I, to be fair to Elizabeth May and the Green Party federally, I mean, their platform in past elections has not just only been about the yeah. environment. Yeah. Um, and the last campaign, she did try to get some pretty well-known star candidate. I mean, the, the former... Uh, weather person from CBC was running as a Green Party candidate right, in the Martin. last election, yes. yeah, in yeah. 2015. Um, and there was a lot of momentum. There was another CBC morning show host who was running in Victoria. Um, but once again, Elizabeth May failed to get anybody else elected but herself. I think the, the problem with the Greens is that they tend to poll actually a lot higher pre-election than come election day. And uh, that's because it's really um, a problem with all progressive, all other progressive parties like the NDP where people look at the ballot, the ballot on election day and they think, well, do I want to hold my nose and vote for a party perhaps I'd like less to avoid a party I really dislike? And Elizabeth May is, you know, a victim of that. But, but the sort of a couple of things have kind of arrived for the Greens. One is uh, climate change is, is increasing in yes. terms of the urgency, I think, for a lot of voters as the evidence rolls in of its seriousness and of the lack of progress perhaps that is being made. That obviously plays to the Greens' favor. And I think also there just seems to be a growing appetite for politicians who don't come across as ordinary politicians. And the Greens have a certain uh, uh, earnestness or, or sincerity to them that's unusual. Now, what will be challenging, we'll just see, can they continue that as the official opposition, where you have to be typically, or traditionally, the expectation has been you're on the attack, you're, you're criticizing the government, and does it, do they start looking a little bit more like ordinary politicians in that case, or do they find a way to do that that is different and new and more in keeping with the, the, the traditional green approach? Can Before I just I add get, something yeah, about yeah, just, I think, federally, if it looks like the Liberals are headed towards the minority, more people may feel more comfortable casting a ballot for the Greens, looking at BC, for example, thinking the Greens might be able to hold the balance of power, uh, and that may give them some sort of comfort than feeling like they're spoiling their ballot. So that I don't get a million uh, texts from my conservative friends after this panel, it, it was a progressive conservative that won in the province, and I noticed that Andrew Scheer quickly claimed that as a victory for him as well, even though it's a progressive conservative party there. Uh, and we've talked a lot about how all these provinces going blue uh, affects the prime minister and, and the liberal government. But Eric, what does it do for Andrew Scheer? Uh, good things, bad things, how does it shore up uh, support amongst Canadians or does it? Well, I mean, it does give his party's brand another win, but uh, the uh, PI uh, PCs are not necessarily a very right-wing party. No. And when you look at the actual results in the election, their vote actually went down from the last election. So it isn't that there was a, a surge in support for a conservative party. There was actually just because the Greens had eaten into the Liberal vote yeah. so much that the PCs were able to move ahead. And when you look at the way that Dennis King, who is the uh, PC leader, uh, there it seems to be approaching things. He's not going to be in the mold of a Doug Ford or a Jason Kenney. Mm -hmm. He's already talking about trying to collaborate and cooperate with the federal government, and he does need to because in a minority legislature, he needs the support of liberals and greens to get anything done. So he can't be uh, one of the conservative so-called resistance uh, premiers that are starting well, to pop it's up not, across yeah. the country. He's probably not as powerful, too, in terms of population and, and the economy and all those things. But so, also, if you look yeah. at his platform, uh, yes. most of it could be cheerfully implemented by a liberal NDP or Green Party. Mm -hmm. I mean, with the, I think there's a couple of tax cuts, but the rest of it is very progressive, liberal, left, whatever term you want to use. And as Eric mentioned, he's, he's not going to be... Uh, uh, taking a tough stand against the carbon tax. He's talked about a made-in PEI solution, whatever that happens to mean, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't sound like he's spoiling for a fight. But it does it does give them a boost of some kind, does it not? The, the blue team, it does give them hope <laughs> in a different way, Althea? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not just that you have... Um Premiers like Jason Kenney and Doug Ford, who have actually talked about openly campaigning against yeah. Justin Trudeau's liberals. But you also now have a number of conservative wins uh, very recently close to a federal election. So the, those ground game teams are already in place. You can quickly reassemble the, those foreign provincial campaigns. And that really does help across the country, whether that's Alberta or in places like Atlantic Canada, where the liberals are quite vulnerable. But the broader message of the whole thing, it seems to me, not just this election, but a bunch of recent elections, is change. 
I'm not saying this yep. versus any particular incumbent, but people are willing to take a look at parties they wouldn't sure. have pre previously been willing to look at. They're willing to throw out governments after one term when previously that would have been less likely. They're willing to vote for third and fourth parties where previously two-party politics was very much the norm. So a lot of the sort of traditional moorings have kind of come loose and, uh, and people are much more sort of free agents when it comes to, to their vote. And that, Eric, makes, well, it makes your job harder, <laughs> but, it's all, but it's also, it makes things harder to understand and predict and, and know where things are going. Yeah, absolutely. So we need yeah. to be ready for that kind of thing. And when people are looking for different options, uh, we're seeing that there are more options now on the table. And if, if you're a voter who is sick of ty uh, politics the way that it's done, but you're angry about it, then there's these populist parties that are starting to pop right. up. And if you're instead tired of it and you just want people to get along, then you do have a party like the Green Party. And I think that's where they have an opportunity. Uh, speaking of getting along, I, I do I do want to talk about the tone of that election because uh, I realized there was a, you know a death of an MP towards the end and everyone suspended their campaigning and, and that sort of changed things. Candy. But it was it was throughout the campaign. The debate was different. Mm -hmm. uh, the response uh, on election night was different. We saw the the PC leader and the Green leader hugging the next day. I mean, sure, it's 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 Islanders and they are very lovely people and they're very friendly. But I wonder what what we can take from that? Um, is it just that they are doing politics differently? Is there, surely there's an appetite in the rest of the country to see people behave that way uh, as politicians, I would think. Andrew? There may be an appetite for it. People always tell the pollsters that. Yeah. Uh, but when the parties are figuring out their strategies, more often than not, it looks like, uh, you know, quote unquote, defining your opponent, i.e. smearing them as X or Y or Z, uh, seems to be a potent tactic. I think there were special factors. It is a very small electorate and people know each other. It's less likely yes. to pay off in that respect. Yeah. But also, the, you know, a lot of the platform, as I say, were pretty similar. And I'm not sure that's necessarily a great thing. I'd rather see a little bit more diversity of offerings so the, the electorate has a more clear choice of, of policy alternatives. Althea? Yeah, I think that, you know, there are 140,000 people in Prince Edward Island and a lot of people know each other and including, you know, the, the fact that uh, the green leader was the dentist of the PC leader's family. <laughs> <Yeah>. I mean, <laughs> it's, that's unusual, right? You're like fighting in the family. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but I do think that the public really wants to see less partisanship. And frankly, it's the media that kind of paints everything as a conflict and the parties themselves who galvanize in that frame that don't want to see the system really change much and uh, we bear a lot of that responsibility I don't think it's the public's fault well and it is a bit uh, yeah. short-sighted on the part of politicians because at least in Prince Edward Island there was the indication that a minority government was likely so the fact that these parties have gotten along mm -hmm. and haven't gone too hard after each other yeah. means that they will be able to work together if you're talking about a, a, a situation like the federal election which could result in a minority government if all of these leaders are going after each other and saying that that each one is is the worst thing that you could yeah. possibly vote for. Eventually, they're going to have to work together if there is, in fact, a minority government after the fall election. But I also wonder if it's not a lesson for for the country. Um, Andrew, is that me being naive again? But it, no, it would be great. Uh, I think we do have to think about the incentives within our political system. When so much of it is about turnout, for example. Yeah. Uh, then a lot of it is a payoff to depressing the other guy's turnout and ginning up your turnout by getting everybody really mad about the terrible things those other guys are promising to do. So if we really want to have a more cooperative, collaborative politics, I do think we, start, we have to start looking at the incentives built into our system that reward uh, more vituperative, more attack-type politics and maybe try and change those incentives. Okay, I gotta go. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Before we go, though, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast, for extra content. This week, we're talking about why political leaders like Jagmeet Singh this week are sharing their stories ahead of election campaigns. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. A little more kindness. I like that idea. Okay, uh, next on the national, our series on burnout at work continues, this time with a question. Can you legislate a fix to overwork? You've got to think about some kind of a work-life balance policy, or you've got to think about some kind of a right to disconnect from electronic communication. And what can we learn from other countries? Next. Productivity has become an individual pursuit. From how we work. I had to do more and more and more and more in order to reach this success. To when we work. Doing night shift kind of works against nature, right? To where we work. I felt very, very lonely. I was starting to get depressed. All this week, we've been exploring modern workplaces and why so many Canadians are battling burnout.
But it's clearly not just a Canadian problem. And depending on where you go around the world, the consequences and the solutions, too, can be quite extreme. So here's the question. How can governments help stop overwork? In the Japanese employment system, normal regular workers, they have a, a sense of guilty to leave the office. That guilt is at the heart of Japan's problem with overwork. It pushes employees to stay late, leave vacation days unused, and to focus on the team. The Japanese workplace has a very collective atmosphere. If the, the department or division had not completed their task, the, the, any member should not leave the office. At its most extreme, that mentality can lead to karoshi, literally death by overwork. In 2017, 190 people in Japan were reported to have died this way, many by suicide. Recently, Shinzo Abe's government introduced this stress check, a mandatory questionnaire asking employees to rate everything from the office dynamic to their own exhaustion, even whether they've had diarrhea. It also brought in a new law, forcing workers to actually use their vacation days, and it's limiting overtime. On average, no more than two and a half hours of OT a day. In other countries, it's a whole different issue. Take France. This is the land of the 35-hour work week, five-week vacations, and most recently, the legal right to disconnect from email after work hours. All of it enshrined in the Code du Travail. La France, au cours des dix dernières années, a souffert une faiblesse de sa productivité. While France's economic problems are complex, some blame the labor code's rigid protections. Too expensive, too expensive to accommodate. Businesses suffer. But the code has its fierce defenders who say, hands off the rights we fought so hard for. So what can Canada learn from all of this? In both the Japanese case and in the French case, it's hard to legislate culture. Sunil Johal is advising the federal government on modern labor standards. His recommendations come this June. But for now, he hints the right answer is a deft touch. Is the needle moving in the, you know, in the right direction? I think so. I mean, I think this is something workers are talking about quite a bit now and very progressive employers are also talking about. And in a competitive marketplace, if you're a company that's moving ahead with progressive policies, you're going to get the best talent. In other words, a helpful nudge from government may be about as far as it should go. The real work left to employees themselves and their bosses. And our series does continue tomorrow with a close look at the video game industry. Very lucrative, worth billions of dollars, yet some developers say when it is crunch time, the hours are painfully long with no overtime pay. And they're starting to fight back. That's tomorrow. The moment is next. Nigeria's first curling team is all smiles after grabbing Nigeria's first curling win. Thank you, everybody, and all your prayers in Nigeria. We love you, and we're excited. We're excited to be here, but uh, we're not a novelty. We're here, to, we're here to compete, and we're here to do the best we can. So on Tuesday, we introduced you to the first team from Africa to ever compete at the World Curling Championships. They represent Nigeria and had dreamed of this moment. Well, a little update. Today, their wildest dreams came true in a game against France, known reputable curlers. They accomplished a whole new first, a win by an African nation. And that moment of pure joy is our moment. I feel over the top excited, happy, elated. Uh, couldn't feel better. Really that, happy. You know, it's that feeling of all our hard work has paid off. We did it. It's just ecstatic. What a what a great dream to share with your best friend. Thank you for believing in us. But thank you everybody and all your prayers in Nigeria. We love you and we're excited. We have one of the greatest coaches in the world. It's his victory as well. The man deserves a big hug and a lot of pats on the back. And he kept telling us, you either win or you learn. And you've been doing a lot of learning. The winning will come. And, and we believed in that and it came. Nigeria, we did it. We did it for you, Sam, Daniel. Musakita, everybody, we did it for all of you Thank guys you. there.
<laughs> that's nice. <laughs> now, their coach is Canadian. So there's our little, like, that's how we got into this story. There you go. And, that's and, our and you know what? I can't even imagine what it must have been like to be in that arena at that time because apparently so you know so all the crowd they were they were going wild and giving them a big round of applause all of the other curlers apparently or at least some of them uh were also clapping when they won i mean That's it's right. just a big moment and and this is after some pretty frustrating moments too i think it was against the czech republic they lost 20 to nothing so boy good for them it's not great <laughs> so the coach from new brunswick uh you heard the american accent they did spend some time in the states so an international win they desperately would love to go to the olympics but not to rain on their parade but that's going to be tough because to, to get into their category in the olympics you have to place in the top seven at the worlds or be the host team nigeria not hosting the winter olympics anytime soon but still enjoying that first historic Win. And thanks to Devin Haru for bringing it to our attention. Yeah, that is the National for Thursday, April 25th. Good night. Good night.